When you can view all human beings as members of your own extended family, your brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers and children, then you will find wherever you go that love awaits you, welcomes you. It is God who gazes back at you when you behold him in all. Kindness is the recognition that all are truly our own. Kindness comes from not minding how others feel about us. It comes from the simple understanding that kindness is its own reward, worth giving out to others because the source of so much sweetness in ourselves. For those of broad sympathies, the very universe is home. Let us affirm, the whole world is my home. And the human race, my family. With God's kindness, I embrace all men. The whole world is my home. And the human race, my family. With God's kindness, I embrace all men. Bring this affirmation into the subconscious as we whisper, the whole world is my home. And the human race, my family. With God's kindness, I embrace all men. And mentally only, focusing the thought between, at the point between the eyebrows, the whole world is my home and the human race, my family. With God's kindness, I embrace all men. Let us pray. Divine Mother, help me to see that by kindness to others, I attract not only theirs in return, but thy kindness as well. May I be kind to others always. May my kindness act as a channel of thy unselfish love. love. Om. Om. Peace. Peace. Amen. (coughs) (coughs) From Whispers from Eternity, Father Divine, banish me not in silence. I stand lonely without Thee. Let me not become imprisoned in my work so as to forget Thee. I will go within to bring Thee without. Where Thou hast placed me, Thou must come. Hidden in the ashes of my burnt sadness, I shall find Thy golden presence. And from rays of the, sa- of the one light, the secret of right action. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramhansa Yogananda. <coughs> one of the most famous stories in the Gospels is that of Martha and Mary. Jesus, visiting the home of Martha, was teaching while her sister Mary sat at his feet absorbed, absorbing his divine love and wisdom. Martha, meanwhile, busied herself with serving her guests and was upset with Mary for not helping her. Lord, she cried, does it not matter to you that my sister has left me to do all this serving alone? Please ask her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. This is a classic story, for Martha's complaint is very understandable, and not on the surface of it spiritually wrong. Jesus might well have told Mary to get up and help her, nor do we really know that he didn't, consider it as he always was of others' needs. 
But the teaching here doesn't concern the obvious dilemma of devotees who work for God, whether to work for God or to spend all one's time in prayer. It concerns, rather, the attitude of the mind. Jesus didn't tell Martha, Martha, you are doing too much. He told her, rather, you are letting your work affect your inner peace. That was the contrast, not work versus contemplation, but restless preoccupation versus peaceful absorption under all circumstances. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita in the second chapter, actions performed under the influence of desire are greatly inferior to those which are guided by wisdom. Happiness eludes people when they act from self-interest. Seek shelter, therefore, in the equanimity of wisdom. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Thank you. The question of how to work, not how much or whether, is the real issue here. <clears throat> and this is something that all of us need to understand. As I was saying yesterday in the satsang, we need to understand that there's a difference between harmful acts and harmful thoughts. When you act unthinkingly, you may, without wanting to, hurt something or someone. Think of all the bugs you kill as you drive your car. You don't get bad karma for it. It's not that you're sitting there gloating, ah, another be beetle, ah, good, another gnat, whatever. You don't think that way. We, if we are harmful in our attitude uh, toward others, that's the real harm. I remember I was in Jerusalem many years ago when I took the photographs for the uh, Holy Land slideshow, the Christ Lives slideshow. And uh, <clears throat> I took a picture of a Muslim market woman who was just sitting on the, on the road selling produce, I don't remember what. And I don't know whether it's against their religion to photograph, it may be, because uh, it was capturing an image, whatever it was, she was absolutely furious with me. And uh, not only was she furious, but she picked up, picked up a vegetable and threw it at me in <laughs> rage. And uh, I felt so badly. She missed me. I could have said, ah, ha, ha, you missed me. <laughs> but she sent her anger, and I felt it. It made my heart uneasy all the rest of that day because the animosity behind it lingered. Well, the same thing is true in the opposite sense in everything that we do. We live in an era uh, where everything is mass-produced, and it's a great thing. It's made it possible for people with not much money to live the, uh, a better way of life than most aristocrats lived 200 years ago. But <clears throat> on the other hand, I sometimes wonder whether there isn't something in handicrafts. You buy things that have been made. I remember my mother gave me a little cross that had been fashioned on Mount Athos by the Greek monks there. And it was not very well done, but it was precious to her and it's precious to me because they had put their devotion into it, their love into it. Now, I don't know the extent to which we feel, but there's something surely going into a, a home that has been lovingly made and going into a home that's been mass-produced. I believe that uh, even um, in, in pottery and in all the things that we do, it isn't just the thing itself. There are two things more that go into whatever it is that you're making. One is your energy. The other is your consciousness. When you can put energy into anything that you do, when you can put um, Willpower. Master said that 
that will is desire plus energy directed toward fulfillment. That's his definition, a very intriguing one, because without the feeling, without the emotional quality, you don't really, um, he said desire, because it's, you can have desireless desire as well as desire. Desireful desire is when you want it for yourself. Desireless desire is when you're doing it because it's right to do. But even that takes will. You have to put energy into anything if you want to succeed in it. This is why so many people on the spiritual path don't really get anywhere because they're not putting their energy out. We have to, when we, when we sit to meditate, when we work for God, either one, we've got to put our will into it. And it doesn't mean a grim kind of will, but it does mean also not to be an armchair philosopher. Reading beautiful, inspiring books doesn't really do it. it keeps you from thinking other things, maybe. But uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't really change you. You've got to put the energy out. This is one of the things that's so wonderful about our schools, these uh, uh, schools that uh, for uh, uh, the art of wisdom, the art of living. The children are not only told principles, they're put through their paces. They're helped to do these things, and in the doing is how we learn how to do. Well, <clears throat> Master one time, to give you a very amusing and interesting story, was uh, cooking. He loved to cook. Uh, when I say that, I always remember somebody who told me he roomed with, or he knew somebody who roomed with Master, and Master would come down and cook. Master explained the reason he liked to cook was because it was a service to others. But the way this man told the story, he just loved to cook, he just loved to cook. It was, made it so ridiculous. How you tell a story has a lot to do with whether you're conveying the story or just fiction. But he was cooking and he, loved to, he did, love, did love to serve other people in that form. I would see him eating the food and he'd hardly touch it. But he was very happy to serve people in, in this way. Well, anyway, he was cooking in the way that you'd expect a master to cook, which is to say, with divine consciousness. And uh, Miramata, who was a disciple of his, was in the kitchen with him. And as soon as he'd clean, uh, finish using a pot, she'd grab it and clean it and uh, uh, get it all ready. So then he'd uh, use a measuring cup. And she'd quickly grab it. So he began to, to teach her a lesson. This is what I'm talking about. He would put us through our paces. He didn't sit there and say, now, don't be like Martha. It's good for you to do things, but do it calmly and so on. No. He just kept dirtying more and more pots. <laughs> it was amazing how we would just dirty pot after pot, using pots he didn't need just to dirty them more. And she was getting more and more frantic to uh, keep up with him. Finally, she understood what he was doing, and she had a good laugh. And he just smiled, he didn't say anything, he didn't dirty any more pots the same way. <laughs> his his uh, <coughs> manner of teaching was to help us to understand. And what he always wanted to make us understand is the attitude with which you do something. It is not the doing in itself that is nearly so important. Yes, of course you have to do it well if you want to. You're not really putting proper consciousness into it if you don't do the best job you can. But uh, there is something about the astral world which is very appealing when you read that Master said that in the astral world you don't write books, you just put your vibrations into them. And people understand, you don't need to page through it like this, reading it. He said, Ma Divine Mother really disciplined me when I was working on autobiography of a yogi. She made me check every word. And uh, I saw him when he was working on the Gita, and he was going through it, editing it the way uh, I would do. Um, but I can also understand why he didn't want to bother to do too much. He'd sort of get the idea across of what he wanted, and then he'd let you figure it out. He, as he, he said to Laurie Pratt, Tara, Tara Mata one time, or as Laurie said to him, and he quoted to me, I should say, 
She said, I'm glad you didn't learn editing, sir. This is what helps me to advance spiritually, and that's the truth. When we work with what he's done and make it better, we're working for him. He's working through us. He has many, many hands and feet. If people are willing to act with him as sort of a partner in whatever they do, this means that we have to have our thoughts on God. Now, the important thing is not to, and this is what most people or many people in spiritual teachings will tell you. You can do your dishing, dishes, let's say, or do your cooking or do whatever it is, but inwardly you're separating yourself from it, just thinking of God. Well, God's in those dishes. God's in that food. God's in everything that you do. You need to direct energy with him, not thinking that he's the one who's sort of regretting that you've got to do it all. He, he, in, he approves of hard work. And uh, I remember when we were out at 29 Palms, and it was very hot out there. And Master, we were digging, and it was, we were perspiring hard, heavily, but it didn't matter. It was joyful work, but he came out to work with us. And uh, he was panting a little bit, and I said, it's hard, hot work, isn't it, sir? He looked at me a little stern, and he said, it is good work. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that you do for God is holy. And you can really, I definitely can taste it when the food that's been cooked has been cooked by somebody whose vibrations are right, which is not what you feel necessarily when you go to a restaurant. It may taste good. I remember, however, one restaurant we used to go to in Calcutta, and I come out of there feeling heavy. It was very good food, culinary-wise, uh, vibration-wise. It was horrible. I don't know what those cooks put in it, but anger of some kind or something. Whatever you do does carry a vibration, and uh, it doesn't have to be outward things that you make, but the way that you uh, act, if you put that consciousness into it, don't just think God, think God through this. Think God is manifesting himself through your hands. Uh, a very good book on the subject is uh, one that was written by Frank Laubach. He was a, a missionary, a Protestant a Presbyterian, I believe, but I'm not sure missionary in the Philippines. And he um, found that he wasn't really getting anywhere converting this, this island of Midnanao, Midnanao, I think it's called. Uh, they were all Muslims. And he couldn't make a dent because they just weren't interested. So he figured, well, this is my time now to think more about God. And so everything that he did, he would deliberately feel, God is using my hands. God is walking through my feet. Call on him with everything. So that he shared every thought with God, not in a he attitude, but you and I together. He talked to him as you, not as he. Well, this attitude changed his whole life. And uh, I met him when he was an old man. He told me at the time, I'm suffering from an incurable disease. I looked sympathetic. He said, yes, old age. <laughs> and in fact, a couple of months later, he, was, he, was, he, was, he died. But it was, he was a saintly man. It was inspiring to be in his presence. But this practice is what we need to do. You know, Master's given the key to Master's teachings. The cornerstone is really the energization exercises. And by sending energy to your arms when you tense them and to your body when you tense it, what you are doing is <coughs> recharging this lump of clay with divine energy and you feel the difference. This is the kind of thing that you need to do and bring into everything that you do. When you meditate, you should meditate sending that energy Doing the energization exercises makes you conscious of that energy, makes you conscious of the flow of energy into your body. It's not the same thing as going out and playing football. You're putting out a lot of energy, perhaps a lot more energy, but you don't feel it as energy because your mind is on the outward things that you're doing. You might say, well, I get a lot of energy, I, I run a lot. Not the same thing. Doing these energization exercises where you're using minimal movement, but maximum 
willpower to concentrate on the energy itself. This is what makes them a spiritual exercise. And the more you get a consciousness of this energy that flows to your arms and legs and all your muscles, the more you also find that this energy is something independent of that. So that if you want something to happen, for example, you just send out energy and feel it going out. And people say it's a miracle. It's not. It's just the use of a basic principle. You know, if you were to take a video today, and assuming you've got the um, video uh, recorder and the television screen and all these gadgets, and somehow could get them all into your time machine and go backwards, say, four centuries, people would say that's a miracle. And you'd explain to them if you knew how. I have no idea how it works. But if you did know how television works, video works, how you can get an image from a little piece of tape onto a screen so it looks like actual people moving and talking, um, you could explain it all if you knew how. And they'd say, come off it. It's just a magic. It's a miracle, that's all. They wouldn't be able to understand it. Well, it's the same thing with, with the miracles that masters perform. It's not miraculous. It's just that they can't really get you to understand it because you haven't the tools of experience to make, to make it work. But if you did, you could very easily. All kinds of, all the miracles of Jesus, all the miracles of the Christian saints, they're commonplace in India where they're, I don't mean that every person you stumble over in a, on a street happens to be a master. No, of course not. But there are great masters living there who treat it quite casually. This Neem Karoli Baba, for example, whom many of you have heard of because of the books of uh, Ramdas. And uh, a friend of mine in New Delhi, who was a disciple of Neem Karoli, Karoli Baba, saw him um, in New Delhi talking to somebody by a car. And he thought, well, gee, I thought he was in Meroli, which is a city some 70 miles away or something. And uh, so anyway, he waved. He didn't want to disturb him. Neem Karoli Baba waved back. And as he walked in the door of his home, the phone rang. And he picked it up. It was a long-distance call from Meroli. And then Neem Karoli Baba came on the other end, and he said, ah, what did you just see? <laughs> <laughs> but these are things that are, are usual. You know, Master used to perform things there that he wouldn't do here because people would be too overwhelmed by them. But they told me in Calcutta one time, he was leaving from Howrah Station, and there was a crowd of devotees all saying goodbye to him, and he was standing on the steps, and he hadn't finished saying goodbye when the time for the train to leave came. And the whistle blew, and the port, all the doors were closed. Master was still standing there on the step of the train, s blessing people. And the train tried to move, and the wheels turned, and it wouldn't move. And finally, this conductor got down and looked and looked and saw this Swami. He said, holy man, please let the train go. <laughs> and Master said, oh, OK. And he got in. But everything depends on that simple one thing energy. But of course there's also black magic as well as good magic. So it depends also on good energy. It depends on doing it as an instrument of God. If you start thinking, oh, I can do it, look at me, how great I am, you will fall, definitely. There was a story, a very interesting story. Uh, Haridas was a <coughs> I've mentioned a Haridas. This is another one. But he was a sadhu Haridas, that's what he ca they called him. And uh, he was buried underground for 40 days and 40 nights and exhumed and was perfectly well. He just went into samadhi and was untouched by it. One time there was a Christian missionary trying to, con co to convert him. They were in a boat together. And so Haridas said, well, what can your Jesus Christ do that I can't do? And they were on the water on a lake. so. Naturally, the missionary told him that he uh, was able to walk on water. What do you think of that, eh? And Haridas said, is that all? He got out of the boat and walked on the water, and the boat followed him wherever he went. <laughs> he had a lot of power, but the Maharaja, Master told me, was a very 
spiritual man. And he said, I know you all think highly of him, but there's something about this man that doesn't work. Not quite right. And sure enough, the man fell spiritually. Years later, he came back to his disciples and he said, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, the, he took them back, they took him back, and he was liberated in that lifetime. When Master told me that he was liberated in that life, Carol Neely, who was helping him to edit his book, said, but how can you, I mean, isn't it much greater sin if you fall after having attained such a height? And Master said, God is no tyrant. Once you really know what you want, he doesn't hold anything against you. He's, as Master used to say, God doesn't mind your faults. All he minds is your love for him. That you love him enough is all that matters. So in that, we have to understand that even though Haridas had achieved great power spiritually, there's another story Master used to love to tell of Baba Groknath. Groknath lived over 200 years. He was very famous. I think he lived in Luck, 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 not Lakshmanpur, that's wrong, in Gorakhpur. That's why he had the name Goraknath. And uh, he developed all the seven, I think it is seven Siddhis that uh, uh, are classically listed in the Yoga uh, Shastras. He could do every one of them. And uh, when he saw that the time to leave his body had come, he wanted to pass this power on to somebody else. When you get your Kriya beads, there's power in those beads, in those, in those leaves. Use them and pray with them. Because anything that has been impregnated has power. And so he uh, condensed these, these uh, eight powers, it was, into eight pellets of mud. Round them up so they were little pellets. And he materialized before this young yogi was sitting meditating on the banks of the Ganges. And he said, I am Baba Garokanath. And the yogi was, uh, didn't react at all. And he said, I am the Baba Garokanath. <laughs> oh? Okay. He said, well, he was a little taken aback, but he said, all right. I, I, have, I'm, I see that I'm about to leave my body. And I have been looking through the spiritual eye to find somebody who is worthy to receive my eight siddhis, my eight powers. And uh, I have chosen you as the recipient of this great blessing. And the yogi took them from him and looked at them and he said, are these to do with as I want? And Guru and I said, well, yes, of course. I've given them to you. He took them and threw them in the Ganges. Guru and I said, my God, what have you done? It took me 300 years to develop these powers. <laughs> The yogi looked at him calmly and said, In delusion still, Gurukhanath. Then he understood that it was all a delusion and he left his body a free soul also. But we have to understand that what we do is not the important thing, but the consciousness with which we do it. And it, if you, as Master said, you can will your arm to lift, but don't send energy, it won't lift. You can send energy to the arm, and hope that it'll lift, it won't. You have to send the will to move and the energy to move it. And that's how you can, you can uh, move your arm, how you do move your arm. Master used to, in his uh, lectures in his early years, he would show what he could accomplish through energy in ordinary ways. Not, he didn't perform great splashy miracles, because Americans would just, I mean, everybody would go towards him for the curiosity of the thing and not understand the deeper side. But uh, um, what was I going to say? Miracles in the early years. Yes, but Dash is perfectly clear in my mind and now it slipped me. Must be getting old, Jyotish. <laughs> <laughs> That's advice I give everybody. Don't go old, get old. Nobody ever listens to me. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Yes. He was on the stage and demonstrating one of these things. He said he, he, would, he would back against the wall and then he'd have people come up from the audience and push against his stomach to hold him there. And he would always be able to, no matter how many people pushed, he could, he could arch his back and they'd all fall backwards a step. Well, one time he did this in Boston and uh, 
he invited people to come up and six burly policemen from the front row came and they thought, we're going to get him. So they were all lined up with all their strength and he said, are you ready? Yeah, like this. <laughs> they all fell over into the orchestra pit. <laughs> but he, the energy that you have is, you, there's a great deal you can do with energy. One time he was on a train and everybody was perspiring and he said, uh, he said, look, the mind can do many things. He said, I'm going to meditate on icebergs. And he sat there for a couple of minutes. He said, feel my arm. It was cold. There's nothing you can't do, but it takes energy to do it. When you put energy out into your work, put energy into it. Consciously feel energy going into it. Feel that you are blessing the food that you're cooking. Feel that you are... Uh, I certainly feel this when I'm writing music or writing a book, I can feel this power coming through me. It, that's why I say, and quite sincerely, it's not mine. But I ask, for, uh, I ask for a melody on some subject, and it's there, just like that. I don't have to sit and puzzle. It's, it's, uh, the divine can help you if you work with him. See, one time, well, in fact, this is the best way to do it. Don't just say, God, please give me a melody. Come on, God. Hey, come on. You, you have to put power into your prayer, too. God, I need a melody, and that melody is... There it is. You'll be amazed. I don't promise you that it'll work. I know it works for me, and I know you can make it work. It may take a little practice, that's all I'm saying. But you can do it. That when you do with, as Jesus said, pray believing... When you completely believe that he can and will, and why shouldn't he, for God's sake? You're his child. It's not a presumption. He, Master said, pray as a demand. But it must be with the consciousness also. There was this story that Master used to love to tell of a man who read in the Bible, if you have enough faith, it will, you can move mountains. And this man uh, had lived in a beautiful place, lovely countryside. The only problem was that although there was a lake outside the window, there was a mountain between him and that lake. And he thought, ha, ah, this is just for me. So he prayed to God with full faith, according to him, that this mountain be moved and thrown into the sea so he could see that lake. And he rushed to the window the next morning, and the mountain was still there. He said, I knew you'd be there. You see, you can't have faith until you know. Faith is not belief. Faith is knowing. Faith comes from having had the experience to make it possible to make these things happen. A master could make the mountain move. It's no, no problem because it's all a dream of God's. He doesn't have to think, oh my God, thousands of tons of earth. I've got to move them. How am I going to do it? <laughs> no. It just changes the dream. God would like for us to have this, this uh, attitude. One time I remember, however, that I was with Master and <clears throat> he said the only liberated Masters in the autobiography are Lahiri Mahasaya, Sri Yukteswar, uh, Babaji, and he mentioned two disciples of Lahiri Mahasaya, Swami Pranabhananda, a saint with two bodies, and uh, uh, the, the, sleeping, the sleeping saint, uh, Ram Gopal Mojumdar. And uh, he didn't mention himself, but he had done so at, on other occasions. And I said, but sir, all these others, I mean, uh, that you praised so highly, weren't they fully liberated? He said, not, not fully. It takes, it takes time. He said that you can, you can go for incarnations as a Jivan Mukta, coming back to help your disciples, you're out of it. You don't create any more karma. But uh, you, as long as you are, uh, still have those incarnations of past karma to deal with, you will, um, you'll still come back, using it if, uh, perhaps only as an excuse, because you could just sort of say, you're, be gone, they, it could be gone. Anyway, I asked him then about different people in the autobiography. <coughs> I asked him about Keshavananda, whom Master met at Haridwar, and I said, Was he, wasn't he fully liberated? He had all these 
powers. And Master said, no, he, Lahiri Maharshi used to scold him for using his powers. It kept him back spiritually. He had powers, yes, but that's not enough. You have to have divine love. You have to do it because God tells you to. One time, this was in, in Serampur. There was a cousin of Tulsi Bose, whom many of you know, who uh, there was a lot of commotion. Master was going to his house, and this cousin died. And I forget the exact details involved here, but Master went into the house, and they were all weeping. And Master uh, went upstairs and brought the man back to life. And Dr. Lewis said to Master years later, but would you have done it, or did you do it just because he was Tulsi's cousin, or did you do it because God told you to? Master said, I would never do anything unless God told me to. In fact, that was really one of the first little tests I had when I met Master. He asked me, he said, I give you my unconditional love. Will you give me your unconditional love and obedience? And I thought, well, the love was easy. I'd give him all I had. But he, uh, I said to him, because I wanted to be honest, I def desperately wanted to be accepted as a disciple, but I wanted to be honest. And I said, well, sir, if you tell me to do something that doesn't seem right to me, then I would be wrong to offer you my unconditional obedience. And he said, I would never ask anything of you that God didn't tell me to ask. And then I said, in that case, I give you my unconditional obedience. That's what a great master does. Master never acted except if God wanted him to do something. He would feel it. He would know it and act that way. Well, what we can do, small as we are, is a little bit of that. Never reach the point of saying, never accept that the thought that he's a master, he can do it. I'm no master. I can't do it. One time, Master was scolding uh, Bernard and urging him to do something which Bernard kept waffling and not doing. And finally, Master said, <clears throat> with great force, you must do it. And Bernard said, but sir, you can do it. You're a master. Master said, what do you think made me a master? It was by doing. And this is what Master wants of you and me, that we do our best that we offer all the energy that we have, the best that we have. Don't worry if it's not great. It doesn't matter. Honestly, God does not care whether you're a great artist or a mediocre artist. I've always loved something my mother used to quote. If a thing is d worth doing, it's worth doing badly. <laughs> In other words, if it's worth doing and you can't do it well, do it anyway. What does it matter? She, she used to play the violin. In fact, my parents met in Paris where she was studying violin, and he was a, a geologist for Exxon, Esso in those days, uh, in Czechoslovakia. But they met in Paris where she was studying violin, and she played with the Ch Chautauqua Orchestra and so on. But when she was quite young, she cut her finger and couldn't bend it. So she had to give up the violin. And in her old age, she took up, uh, she took up the violin again and learn from somebody I hope to visit in Palo Alto who's still alive, Avis Hull. Hull. But uh, anyway, we, I used to know her when my parents were alive. But the thing is that she couldn't play the violin well. She couldn't quite get the notes right. It was a little painful to hear her miss those notes because this finger always was, uh, something didn't work right. But it was worth doing, so it was worth doing badly. Don't forget that little saying. It's, don't think you've got to be perfect at it. Don't think that God watches for perfection. What he really watches for is that you put your whole heart into what you do. He watches the attitude. He doesn't watch the product. <coughs> Mind you, if you really love what you're doing and want to do the best, it doesn't mean that you should remain satisfied with doing it badly. Do the best you can, and that best you'll find takes a lot of work. I've been appalled to see a page that I've written and think, how could I have made that many mistakes? I mean, I, I write decently, I think. And I, I edit moderately well. And I think, how could I have done that? 
words in the wrong place and so on. Not just bad typing, bad intentions. <laughs> Let's face it, I have to work over a page maybe 50 times before I'm satisfied. That, you, you have to be conscientious is what I'm saying. Do your best and don't be satisfied with that. But that's what God's looking at. Your desire to do your best, not the product itself. There, uh, I've seen Master thrilled with things that people did with love that had no quality in them at all because he loved that attitude. The attitude is what God watches. So when you work, when you do anything, Put energy into it because it's the energy that's going to move the typewriter keys or move the stirring of the pot or do whatever you're doing. Energy is going to do it. But when you have consciousness behind the energy, and it takes consciousness to direct energy, as Master demonstrated with the energization exercises, when you have the right consciousness, that becomes a wholly different thing. You direct energy, yes, but you direct it with joy with love. I tell you, it was just a heavenly experience eating something Master had cooked. You just felt so good afterwards. I had a marvelous experience that way. Uh, one time it was Christmas. <coughs> I was at Mount Washington and I was helping the monks who were cooking for the monks dinner on Christmas Day. And we were singing chants and Christmas carols and I was, it was that moment of great joy. And we, I just put all that joy into what I was doing, and I'm sure that uh, everybody did. Well, then we had the banquet, and I must not have been eating well that week. M maybe it was that, maybe it was something else, but everybody was laughing at me the way I ate. I just ate and ate and couldn't get enough. I was bulging with this food. And afterwards, I had a wonderful meditation. You wouldn't expect this. I mean, when you're full of food, <laughs> it, was, it was very different. There was a, a joy in the eating that not only gave me a good meditation, but I remember when I woke up the next morning, I heard angelic voices in my mind singing, Oh God, beautiful. What you put into your food, that's why mother's cooking tastes so good. Not that it, you've somehow grown up accustomed to this mess. <laughs> it's because she's doing it for her family with love. And you feel that love. And you could go to a great restaurant where they can make it much better. It just doesn't taste the same. So what you do in anything, how you speak to people is so important. It isn't enough to say things. You know the expression, smile when you say that, partner. <laughs> well, it's more than... When you say things in the wrong way, it isn't necessarily the tone of your voice or the smile or anything, but there is a vibration. When Master in the, on that park bench shouted at that crook to get out, that just shook him all over. Master was standing, I think it was on the streets of Philadelphia. These three hold-up men came to him and demanded all his money. <coughs> he just took his wallet out and gave it to them. He said, you can have it. He said, but you can't take my real treasure. They looked at each other, what's the matter with this guy? I mean, money was the only treasure they knew. He was talking about his love. He said, but I can give it to you. They said, this guy crazy? He looked at them with so much love that they just suddenly started weeping. And they just said, we don't want your money. Can you take it back? And they ran, they couldn't understand what had happened. This kind of power is what you can put into everything you do. And you will, to your extent. You can't do it the way Master or Christ or Larry Marsha or anybody of that stature does it. That doesn't mean you can't do it at all. Of course you can do it. The more you bless people, don't think, oh, well, who am I to bless anybody? No, you're nobody to bless anybody. But if you ask God to do it through you, he can. Larry Marsha himself never accepted that he did it. He did many miracles, but he never accepted the ego principle, Master wrote in Autobiography of a Yogi. It was always the divine working through him. One time, Master said, people are saying that I've lost my powers. Master said, I don't even know that I ever had any powers. It wasn't he. It was just attunement with the divine, and these things flowed through him. But when you have that consciousness, you develop a relationship with God that is so sweet 
Uh, it's very... <coughs> Excuse me, it is getting better. <clears throat> it reminds me of a beautiful little story Master told. He used to love Scott shortbread. And uh, he was in Laguna Beach where they made very good shortbread. And so he would often bypass on his way down to Encinitas. There weren't the freeways then that there are now. And they'd drive through Laguna Beach and he'd stop at this place. Well, one time uh, he sent uh, Virginia in to get him some shortbread. And she came back and she said, the lady says she's all sold out. And Master wasn't disappointed as uh, a person would be if he had a desire for that. It was just a thought, you know. But he was surprised because he said, but Divine Mother, he thought, Divine Mother does everything for me. And so with that thought, he just looked up and he said, Divine Mother, how come? Suddenly he saw this beam of light shine down on that building. And a few seconds later, this woman came running out with a package. She said, please, wait, 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 don't drive away. I was holding this for a customer who ordered it, but I can make another batch for them. I'll give the, I want you to have this. This is the sweetness of, see, if God saves your life, well, he's likely to if you've got a great destiny or a work to do or anything. It's not your karma, whatever. But when he does something totally unnecessary, like that shortbread, it's a, another kind of sign. That is the kind of relationship that we need to develop with God. Not this odd, oh, holy, great, infinite Lord, trans, uh, trans, uh, transcending all things and omnipotent, omniscient and everything. Don't bother with all that nonsense. He knows it. <laughs> he doesn't need flattery. <clears throat> Master said, when I hear praise the Lord, I, I think of God as some... Uh, rich lady pampered. You don't have to pamper God. Talk to him the way you feel. Master would scold God sometimes. He would say, God, why do you allow these people to suffer like this? Of course, he knew the answer. But uh, that kind of relationship where you do it not out of anger, but with love, when you do that, then uh, you will find that your very work takes on a different meaning. There's a different feeling in it, and I really do think that handicrafts have a certain, a certain something that you don't get when you buy machine-made articles. They have the vibration of the maker, and if the maker has been a good person, and most people who make handicrafts probably are basically good people because they want an alternative to just machine-made things. That shows there's some consciousness there already, but things that you get that are made that way, things that Master owns, it's just a joy to touch them. It's not just imagination, it's, it's something real. Whenever you do anything, just walking, just eating, anything, feel that it's God working through your body, working through your thoughts. And then when you try to separate your mind and think about God, there doesn't have to be that dichotomy. Just bring him into what you're doing. God, shall I add more pepper? Um, God, have I stirred this enough? Master said when he cooked, his mind would be at the point between the eyebrows. He'd taste it here. Indian cooks don't taste food anyway. They feel it pollutes it. Why? I don't know since they don't have to use the same spoon. But nonetheless, um, that's their feeling. But he didn't. He said, I taste it right here. I know just exactly how much spice to add. I taste it here. <clears throat> and uh, you could tell it. It was just, it was something divine about it. Well, when you think of God in that way, make him active in your life, not passive. Don't think, well, he, he means he's off there somewhere in the clouds. Think you, think we, we're doing this thing together. You'll be surprised how somehow everything flows beautifully. And then what the Bhagavad Gita taught, is that your, your thoughts are the only really important thing that matter. Your consciousness, the joy that you bring to your work, the love that you bring to people when you're with them, these things can change lives. If you do it just because Master said we have to do it, it doesn't mean a thing. Put his consciousness, bring him into what you're doing, and you'll be surprised to see how beautifully everything flows. Okay.